Welcome back to another episode of the Hermit Poetry Series. I'm Neil Eakin, and on this channel, I read poetry. Mostly work by contemporary poets, occasionally poems from the past, and once in a while, poems of my own. Uh, today, we are continuing a series that looks at translation, and specifically at one particular poem by the great uh, Chinese poet Li Bai, uh, translated 13 different ways, and considering how each translation um, operates, uh, what choices they make, and how they engage, explore, expand, or at times obscure the original meaning. Um, and so, uh, without further ado, let's go into the translations. So let's go back to Ezra Pound and his 1915 translation, uh, which he renders as taking leave of an old friend. Um, so I'll just reread the poem, and then we'll talk a little bit about some of the notes that I have. Um, things that stood out to me about what was happening in the poem, some of the choices that Pound makes, uh, some characteristics of the translation, and also a few things that I note um, are either missing or um, obscured by this particular translation. Um, okay, taking leave of an old friend, Ezra Pound. Blue mountains to the north of the walls, white river winding about them. Here we must make separation and go out through a thousand miles of dead grass. Mind like a floating wide cloud, sunset like the parting of old acquaintances who bow over their clasped hands at a distance. Our horses neigh to each other as we are parting. So... For Pound, it seems, uh, well, when we read this, we can hear certain things are, are privileged or at least brought up um, more prominently. Um, immediately, we hear Blue Mountains and White River as um, sort of features or elements that are highlighted. Um, they appear at the beginning of the lines. They match the order that they exist in the, uh, in the original. And I think definitely emphasize the, uh, the physicality, the, the landscape element of it. Um, in, in fact, what I would say, of what is characteristic about Pound's translation is that it privileges image, not surprisingly, and it also um, retains sort of that sense of a, a very painterly approach. Uh, there are broad, bold gestures and moves that are made throughout the poem and a lot of energy. And I think, um, I think because of that, there is a, a way in which um, that energy carries us through the poem and allows us to, to trust this particular voice. It's been noted about Pound's translations of the Chinese that they actually aren't from the Chinese uh, original text. They're coming through notes from Fenelosa um, of Japanese translations of these poems. And what's striking is that um, Pound often intuitively understands where the poem is going in the original and makes adjustments um, and clarifications, corrections even, that, <laughs> that Pound is able to uh, make clarifications, adjustments, and even corrections from the raw notes that he's been delivered from this other translation and return, even though he has not seen the Chinese text, back closer to the original text. Um, so I, I would call this kind of a really remarkable gift that Pound has of uh, understanding sort of poetically what's happening in the original text, sensing that, and even through the filter of another translation, being able to recover what was lost. Now, that being said, there are also things that show up in his translation, which are clearly interpolations, things that he's added in, um, either to appease or, in his mind, what his vision of the scene looks like, um, or perhaps as a result of sort of cultural stereotypes that existed that he may have unconsciously just bought into in his representation. Um, so we, we think about these, these striking sort of bold blue mountains, white river, um, you know, if you hear that dynamicism, it's it's winding about them. It's it's not something static here. Something's moving. Um, here we must make separation. Although I don't particularly care for separation as the word here, I think the emphasis, the emphatic voice here, is very much what's in the original. Um, and then then let's see what else would I would say. Um, I think I really like sort of the way that he preserves um, sort of that. 
our horses neigh to each other as we are parting. He creates that parallel between what's happening with the horses and what's happening with the people. That's in the original. He inverts it slightly. Um, the people wave goodbye and then the horses um, have their encounter. But the way he phrases it makes sense. Um, things that, that, oh, and the other sort of oppositions that uh, are preserved um, to some degree are sort of the opposing of the cloud and the sunset and the or the sinking sun um here i i think we start entering into the places where pound veers a little off track the translation obscures certain things that are present in the original um as opposed to sunset it is a setting sun and it's important that it is a separate element of being sun because that's being opposed to the clouds so in pound's formulation that sort of parallel structure, which he privileged at the beginning, starts to disappear a little bit here. So instead of clouds being opposed to sun, um, setting versus uh, wandering or floating, we start to lose a little of these finer details in here. Um, and Pound is also turning to a more explicit comparison format. Mind like sunset, like, so we get this simile format um, for, for trying to emphasize these type of things. And this type of equation of one thing to another um, is definitely more of a Western tradition and not really reflective of the poetry of this particular period in China. Um, if more often than not, you will see things juxtaposed without a uh, explicit connector or explicit sort of way of interpreting why these things are placed next to each other. Um, so these are some of the things that, that change with Pound's translation. Um, probably one of the most obvious things that shows up that isn't in the original is this whole image. Uh, and I go back to Pound's preference for image and viewing this as an entire scene. He has them bowing their clasped hands at a distance, which feels, honestly, it feels a little... Um, it feels like he's he's created a scene based on his imagination of what these two old friends would have done um, that's not really in the text itself. Um, he's imagined them in a fairly stereotypical way, bowing and clasping hands. Um, the text itself says, wave hands. And, um, and I think I've talked elsewhere in one of these other videos about the interesting thing about wave hands as a phrase. In Chinese, the characters actually show, so the hui is, is a hand radical or arm radical, basically it's a hand radical, next to a covered wagon character. The two of them together form the new character, which means to wave. Um, and then the, uh, the, the hand, wave hands, the show at the end, is literally just the hand. So you basically have hand, covered wagon, and then hand. And so there is a visual pun happening or a visual representation happening that goes beyond sort of traditional Chinese, you know, it's, it's m even cleverer than what you would expect to see. And, um, and so we kind of, if we want to picture our friends waving goodbye, that's literally it right there. Um, we, uh, we don't have a, a sense that they're bowing to each other and going. Um, and so I think these are these are small things that kind of jump out as being differences. Um, okay, and the other thing that changes here is he's reduced the ten thousand um, li to a uh, thousand miles of dead grass. Um, so this is another image that has changed, which is originally it is um, it is sort of the the gu pang the the sort of the lone flower, well, for the sake of um, our imagination, we'll imagine it as more like a dandelion than it is a tumbleweed, but it is sort of this windblown, dried out flower that that dry, that dry flies across the, the distance, right? And so instead of having that image, a single lone thing that flies on the wind, he has now replaced it with a thousand miles of dead grass. It is the great expanse now that has become dead and um, sort of that fallow, um, you know, old dead grass. Um, so there, what's disappeared then is that whole image. Um, so there's the irony of Pound is that as good as he is at capturing the rest of the image, he loses a few of these other images 
Um, and that's just a problem with translation. We can't do everything. Um, so anyways, that's, uh, that's Pound's take on things. Um, and um, okay. So we'll move on to another one. Okay, so uh, our next one is going to be uh, Witter Binner's uh, 1929 translation, um, which he titles Farewell to a Friend. With a blue line of mountains north of the wall and east of the city a white curve of water, here you must leave me and drift away like a loosened water plant hundreds of miles. I shall think of you in a floating cloud, so in the sunset think of me. We wave our hands to say goodbye, and my horse is neighing again and again. Um, okay, so once again, there are things here that I feel that Bidner is doing exceptionally well, or at least uh, has prioritized in his translation. Um, so we note here that there are certain elements of uh, the sort of the elements that appear at the beginning of the poem that Bidner does preserve. Um, he does oppose the blue and the white. Um, here he's actually gone so far as to make the phrase blue line and white curve. Um, now it's no longer these elemental things as separate, you know, atomized components, but that entire gesture, blue line, white curve, um, mountains north of the wall, east of the city, water. So they're all there. They're not necessarily structured in that um, perfectly lined up parallel structure that exists in Chinese, um, which is very difficult to pull off in English. Um, but it's clear that Binner has prioritized getting the specific elements preserved and not necessarily the ordering of them, and instead restructuring them to be a little bit more familiar to English. Um, and let's see some of the other things, uh, that happen here. Um, I think another thing that stands out as being, um, perhaps a, a, an interesting choice about how to preserve other types of repetition and parallel, um, the, the horse neighing again and again at the end is, a, is another way, instead of the neighing being the repeated part, it's the again and again, um, which I think works. I mean, here he's chosen to create a similar effect. Um, in the original Chinese, the sound that's repeated isn't the neighing of the horses either. It is uh, more of a plaintive sound that could be the wind or could just be the sigh. But it's something that, that's really hard to pin down in, um, in, in sort of a translation into English. So instead, Binner's opted to preserve it in a different way, which is to use this repetition of sort of this, um, I, I mean, to me, it sounds almost like the car that won't start over, you know, turn over as you hear it over and over and over again. So when trying to crank through it, the horse is, is neighing again and again and again, um, and probably, you know, getting quieter and quieter with each call. Um, so I think we, he creates that type of a, an audio, um, an oral image, an auditory image for us in that respect. Um, there are a number of things that I think Binner does that obscure aspects of the original and, um, and some things that simply veer way off track and we have no idea. Um, I'm not certain why he's chosen to go this way. So, for example, um, you know, while he does preserve the sense of this, here is the place of parting, here you must leave me, and drift away. So he's combined the drifting that it was really associated to the windblown thing um, that, uh, you know, so that flower, that dandelion, that tumbleweed as it's sometimes translated. But that thing that's windblown is now explicitly tied to the, you know, to the, the other person. Um, while that is implied, that's not explicitly stated in the poem. Um, and so there's a way in which he's made this more obvious. Um, the, I, I think for me, the, the, the phrase that grates the most in this one is probably loosened water plant, um, which I feel is very clunky and very literal and at the same time, completely inaccurate. It's not a water plant. And it's not the plant itself that gets loosened and blown all over the place. It is, it's flower. Um, so because of that, I think that here it just kind of 
grinds to a stop and it doesn't quite sound right. The other thing that changes is vendors opted for some reason to go with hundreds of miles instead of thousands of miles or tens of thousands of miles. Um, and somehow hundreds of miles just feels a lot, well, I mean, it is physically a lot shorter. It doesn't have the same sense of vastness. It's not like you're crossing the Gobi Desert. Um, there's, it just feels a little bit less permanent and I, I think, or, or less daunting of a journey. Um, it's still a long journey, but it doesn't have the same weight. Um, Benner's also done this, this odd thing of, of uh, really shifting the focus away from the natural elements onto the, um, onto the human elements. And I think this is a, a fair way of, of summarizing a lot of these translations. This is a, perhaps a, a translation blind spot for a lot of people culturally, um, especially during this period you would see that philosophically um, it is the natural world that takes precedence over the human one. And paintings and other forms of artwork and poetry often privilege and prioritize the representation of the natural world and its vastness in comparison with the smallness and uh, not necessarily insignificance, but just the smallness of the human. And so what happens in the vast cosmos or in the great nature um, does impact what happens to us. It is, there's a connection without it being causation. Um, and at the same time, there's no, there's no sense that we need to prioritize our own experience over the natural world. Um, so I think the, the phrasing, I shall think of you in a floating cloud, so in the sunset think of me, is awkward just grammatically. It's, it tries to create this type of parallel structure um, and is a reciprocation, but it's, it's, that's not in the original in the same way. Um, and I think it loses a number of things. We lose that opposition between like the floating cloud and the, the sun that sets. Now it's the sunset, is sort of an event versus the physical object of the sun setting. Um, so we lose some of that dynamic opposition. Um, and I think we, the, some of the other things that we end up losing here are just sort of the sense that, you know, what there is a way in which, you know, the poem is saying, what does it matter in the great nature, you know, these two people parting? And yet at the same time, it does matter. You know, there are powers that are much bigger than us, and we are being led apart. But at the same time, it doesn't change the fact that I still feel this sinking feeling in me when I say goodbye. Um, and I think that, that type of tension gets lost in here. Um, so I'd say Binner's, Binner's translation, uh, I think at times privileges certain front loads it on the sort of the literal aspects of the um, you know, trying to capture those individual elements at the beginning, but then transitions, transforms itself into something else that that wants to, um, I would say, wants to present instead a slightly more westernized vision of what a farewell looks like. Um, and so I, I think especially that, that Hollywood version of it I shall think of you in a floating cloud, so in the sunset think of me. Just feels kind of weird. Okay. Okay, so our next one that we'll look at here is uh, from Gary Geddes and George Liang. Um, they translate the poem as to see a friend off. North of the city wall, green hills extend and sparkling waters lap its eastern edge. It's here we bid the last farewell. You'll travel like the tumbleweed too far. Even your thoughts are wayward clouds, while this friend's heart is sinking like the sun. Wave to me now and be off. I hear the impatient whinnying of your horse. Um, so I think with, with Geddes and Young, there's, there are certain things that definitely um, pop out as being particularly successful. I, I think um, they... They capture here um, a number of the oppositions that we, we talked about before. Um, so we do get the north and the east. We do get the green hills and the sparkling water, the city wall and the eastern edge. Um, we 
we lose one curious thing, which is the extending does kind of emphasize the horizontal or straightness. And lapping, um, we lose sort of the rounding or the curvature, and instead it becomes something almost... Um, I don't, I don't know. It, it feels more dynamic in here instead of being sort of, uh, sort of those elements being opposed to each other directly. Um, the, uh, the other thing is I think that uh, green does evoke very much the sort of the verdant, fertile, um, very living sort of uh, sense of the mountains and the hills. Um, and it's also the color right but sparkling is colorless and I think that's a missed opportunity here um, uh, they they render um, sort of here is the place of parting becomes it's here that we bid the last farewell which I think overall overall works um, I don't know where the finality of the last farewell comes from um, unless it's implied, and I think this is perhaps the reasoning, is that there are multiple farewells up until the final point where you just simply run out of places to say goodbye. And it's it's like if you, today, if you went to, well, not so much these days, but if you went to the airport um, to drop a friend off um, who was going to take off on a plane, you might drop them, you might say goodbye on the way in to the airport. Then you pull up to, you know, the the um, departure area and you might help them unload you know their luggage out of your car and then you would say goodbye again and then um, you know in the olden days <laughs> um, you might even park your car and wait for them to go through uh, check in and and um, and send their baggage off and then before they go through security that final time there could be a last farewell so I think that perhaps is sort of the thinking behind this phrasing the last farewell um, uh, let's see what what Gettys and Liang do here that I think is particularly well executed or at least preserved is the the opposition of the clouds so the wayward clouds sinking like the Sun we get that now we no longer have the sunset, which is more amorphous event based, and now we have sort of the physicality, the dynamic of the sun sinking. The clouds become the wayward thing, um, which they are, but we don't get the sense of the moving so much as that they are implicitly or intrinsically wayward. Um, eh, it, 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 the sentiments there, I think. Um, Thoughts and heart. Um, the 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 one quibble I would have here is that in the original, it's less specific as to who is whose heart, heart, whose thoughts. Um, in Gettys and Young's translation, they opt to make it more explicit to say that your thoughts and this friend's heart, me, I, these these type of pronouns and these type of indicators as to who is who. And that dynamic of the relationship, that's more explicitly stated here than it is in the original. Um, is that an error to do it that way? I don't necessarily think so. I think it's really, you know, it's just, uh, it's part translation. You're going to have to make some choices about what you preserve. Do you want that feeling of being paired back and stripped back to the point where it is just the elemental pieces, the experience, and the, the self? the I and the you get primarily erased or at least downplayed significantly. Um, and this is a different, this is a different um, sort of privileging here. So for Gaius and Liang, I think the, the, the priority here is to create a poem that does honor to the original while at the same time feels a little bit more contemporary. There is a way in which it is, it's more complete and more whole. Um, it does feel slightly more contemporary um, I think at the end, it's this wave to me now and be off. I hear the impatient whinnying of your horse. Again, puts me now towards a more contemporary scene um, as, as if you were, um, you know, that final, oh, okay, let, let's, let's finally be done with our goodbyes. Goodbye. And I, you know, your horse is running right now. I mean, it, it, here it, it sounds, uh, very much it does, call to mind like airports and taxis you know it's like if I were like uh, saying goodbye to a friend in my house and uh, 
they were leaving, you know, they'd stayed overnight and now they were off to catch their taxi to get to the airport. And I would say, yeah, you really should get going now. Your taxi's running. Um, I can hear it outside. Um, <laughs> I feel like that's, that's kind of what has happened in here is that the impatient winning of the horse um, is kind of this momentum to push, push things off. And I don't think that's, the, I think instead, the original captures more of a sense of reticence about a reluctance to leave. That to accept this goodbye is also to say that there is a chance that one does not return. Um, that this could be the last farewell. So I, I think that's that tension between the last farewell and the impatient winning of the horse is a little odd for me in here. Um, but overall, I, I think it's a poem that kind of captures a lot of what the original is doing, um, even if it makes a few um, odd choices. Oh, a couple last things to note. One uh, being like that whole sense of 10,000 li, um, that, that vast distance just simply gets compressed down to too far, um, which I think might be a too far, too far. Um, I would like to see a little bit more of that, that sense of vastness preserved. Um, and um, as we've talked about before, the tumbleweed is kind of a stand-in. It's a Western translation. You know, it pulls in sort of a, a similar but not identical, um, you know, reference that we have. And I think if that's your goal is to, to kind of create that sense of like, oh, what travels long distance is blown by the wind? It's the tumbleweed. Um, so I think that that's that's an adequate choice um, and fair for now. Okay, so let's. Well, I think um, I think this is a good one to end on, and we'll pick up some more uh, in the next episode. Um, I'm not. I'm trying to keep these relatively short. So if you enjoyed listening to this particular episode as I go through some of these translations, and would like to um, hear more, please like this one and comment below. Uh, subscribe to the channel, and I'll be back every Tuesday, Thursday, and Sunday with more content. Um, we're partway through this particular series. Um, I think there's maybe one more episode of me going through um, these translations, and then um, we'll be resuming uh, the usual content where I just read primarily poetry um, until some other project or, or idea comes to mind and I'll take on a different uh, discussion. Uh, so thanks for staying tuned, and uh, we'll be back again soon. Until next time, please uh, stay safe, stay well, and keep reading poetry. <laughs>